I have two sides, math and linguistics, and chemistry, but that's not important. Often, mathematics is called the language of the universe, since any basic law can be defined using mathematical expressions, and English, for one, is just language. That's the closest a comparison between math and language ever got. Math communicates something, so it's a language. But I want to see languages be incorporated somewhere in mathematics. I want to see a formal definition of linguistics. Some formal linguistics. That's it. I'll invent a form of ma- Wait. Noam Komsky? You mean the writer of the syntactic structures book I already have? He made a form of math? So let's start with the obvious question. Who is Noam Komsky? Noam Komsky is a public intellectual in MIT known for being the father of modern linguistics, while also doing political activism and social criticism stuff. <coughs> Professor Komsky wrote a book in 1957 entitled Syntactic Structures, a book describing how syntax is different from semantics. The meaning of words are different from the way they're ordered. The math nerds who learn programming languages likely have heard of something else of his, the Komsky hierarchy, a list of types of languages and grammars that bear way too much a resemblance to those number sets. Unfortunately, before I actually get into the types of languages and their subsequent cursed conlang circus submissions, I'll have to explain some simple terminology. This is a syntax tree, which shows the sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That is technically grammatically correct, but nonsensical. The letter S at the top, which means sentence, is the starting symbol, since it kickstarts the production of a sentence. The lines between the two symbols are the production rules, rules that govern how to construct a sentence, so S becomes a noun phrase and a verb phrase, which becomes more of what are called symbols. A non-terminal symbol, a symbol that is affected by production rules, is represented by these capital letters, while terminal symbols are the words below that mark the end of the production rule, and they are represented here as an English word. The terminal symbols, which I will call words for now on, are a part of what is called an alphabet or vocabulary. All of these production rules form a grammar, while a language that uses such a grammar is a language. An important operation for what sentences are grammatically correct is called the clean star, which gives back a list of finite length words using any number of repetition or defined symbols or using none at all. Got that? Good. The juice of this video is going up the Komsky hierarchy. Let's start with the one you speak and I speak. Context-free languages, type two on the hierarchy. But Sal, how can a language be context-free if a language must use context to be communicable? To that I say you, an individual in a quantum superposition of biological gender, clearly have been educated in normal linguistics, but not the formal one. Context, in this case, is syntactic, not semantic being how a symbol changes depending on the symbols around it. In this case, a language is context-free when a symbol doesn't change any other symbols around it, or depending on them, making construction straightforward. There are tons of languages that are context-free. In fact, all natural languages are, especially most of the CCC3 conlangs, including, but not limited to, Project Wedge, Psy, Atlantean, Proto-Antarctic, and even my submission. Regular grammars, type three, are types of context-free grammars defined by having a non-terminal symbol be created on either side of a terminal symbol, either left regular or right regular, in what is also called a linear grammar. Constructions of verb phrases can either be some verb and a noun phrase, like in English, or a noun phrase and a verb, like in Japanese. So technically, a head initial syntax is right regular, while a head final one is left regular. Higher up is type one home of the context-sensitive languages. When a language is context-sensitive, it changes depending on the symbols surrounding it, or changes them entirely. One of these context-sensitive languages was made by Walter von Dijk, aptly named the Dijk language. This language uses only brackets that are required to be paired by being opened or closed. So this is a valid word, but this is not. For that reason, Cesium Fox's entangled hypoanalytic language is considered context-sensitive since, quote, Meaningful units in the language usually consist of two parts, the L part and the R part, unquote. So basically words are brackets. Another type of context-sensitive language is an indexed language, which uses a grouping of repeating functions in a stack. If you want a better example of indexed language and a better explanation of them, check out WIWA or Anthem's AHL, which is based on WIWA. 
At the highest point is the type 0 unrestricted grammars, those that are analogous to Turing machines. These languages can change no matter what, morphing a cluster of terminal or non-terminal symbols into a single symbol or maybe the opposite way around. Controversial take, but I think K clients Panafi is technically unrestricted since a single word can mean two or more things very distinct from each other, especially some where it being its own opposite. In a language, how the language is created is entirely up to its production rules. Let's look at our language's production rules. Okay, simple, right? Well, let's try this. Start by taking our noun phrase and splitting it into an article adjective, and noun subphrase, as I'll call it. My noun subphrase is like a noun phrase, but without an article, so split that up into another adjective and noun subphrase, and then that splits up again, and again. Uh, okay, we can apply infinitely many adjectives to our sentence, assuming that we have enough adjectives to do that, which makes our language recursively enumerable, and therefore recursive. In this example, it's left recursive, since we are applying an infinite amount of adjectives to the left of our noun subphrase. And yes, there are non-recursive grammars too, creating finite languages. An example of one is the sequitur algorithm, which generates a single string. Grammars that generate a single string are called straight line grammars. Okay, but seriously, what do you need this for? Well, to name the most important one, to write and compile programming languages. You can apply formal linguistics to write a programming language that is checked through a lexical analyzer, which turns words into parts of speech, and a parser, which writes out the structure of the sentence, which holds the words, creating either a parse tree or an abstract syntax tree. And there's more to learn about this, but I'm just going over the basics. If you want to fall into the formal linguistics rabbit hole, be my guest, because there's way more to learn.